Uh, welcome, everyone. We are so grateful that you are joining us on our master class today. I think this is the, the most folks we have had on a master class today. So um, it's good to see the folks have questions and um, are hopefully excited about this model and want to learn more. Uh, so we're going to start with brief introductions. We're um, joined by folks from two churches. Um, Barb Chapman is from the Community Church of Chapel Hill uh, Unitarian Universalist, and then Spencer and Jerry are from First Congregational United Church of Christ up in Asheville. And both churches have been incredibly helpful and generous with their, their time um, and knowledge to our strategic planning task force as we've gone through this process. Uh, and I think one of the things that we appreciated about um, both uh, of their churches is they had a different experience with the Hotchkiss model, uh, but it is, it is rare to um, hear anyone talk about government, governance in a church with excitement. And both churches, when we talked to them, um, yeah, they, they, they were selling us this model um, and had no reason to do so. And we're, we're passionate about it. And uh, that's infectious. So we wanted uh, them to share their stories with you today and answer some of our questions. Um, so why don't we start with Barb and uh, we can each make some introductions and then I'm going to, Lindsay, then you can jump in and Lindsay will guide our conversation today. Uh, please stay muted, but at the end, we'll open it up for questions. And you can also use the chat box um, to post questions, and I'll, I'll make sure we're, we're seeing those as well. So, Barb. Uh, we, uh, uh, the community church um, evolved to this model because we had gotten to the point where we were no longer a programs, uh, we were no longer, we were no longer a pastoral sized church. We'd become a program sized church. We'd crossed over the 150. We were over 200 right now. We're at about 433, which is just at the high end of the um, program sized church. And when our church started back in night, uh, was founded in 1953, it was a small group. Uh, very much uh, connected with the civil rights movement. And this was hard for people to go to, the, there were some people who were concerned about going to a different way of governance where we didn't have everybody in on every decision, but it had become unwieldy. unwieldy. And um, we were just kind of stuck in a rut. So that, Megan, is there anything else you want me to add to that? No, I think it's great just giving everyone a little context of who you are and what your experience with the Hotchkiss model is. And I know in your case, I think you are part of um, the group that's like our equivalent of a strategic planning task force that led the effort. And I think you've now served in the model as well, right? Right. I, um, I came on the board for the first time in 2008. And from 2008 to 2011, um, the there was a, gr a, a group of three, four of us that worked on the policies. And um, it was a member of our congregation who actually knew Hotchkiss and had worked with him who underwrote hiring him as a consultant for us. So we Skyped with him several times. And he, over, he looked over uh, what we wrote. And so that, that was, that was wonderful guidance. And that was, that was a very big help. But um, we worked for three years. No one can really believe the amount of time we put in on this. Three years, we met for two hours every Friday morning, um, at, at least every other Friday morning for two years before we had enough pulled together. And other congregations were incredibly helpful in, we'd say, may we use so and so, oh, take anything you want, anything we can do to help you. So people were incredibly generous with us, but this was a long time coming, a long time putting together. We had lots and lots of listening meetings within the church uh, to get feedback from people. Um, so it, and, and then, when we launched into our trial year in 2011, nobody seemed to even notice. 
It just went beautifully. Well, thank you, Barb. Um, so why don't we hear also from Spencer and Jerry, you all are both from the um, First Congregational Church, correct? Could you just introduce yourselves a little bit and say how you were involved in the process of um, starting the Hodgkiss model at your church and, and if you are still involved in leadership uh, there at the church? Jerry, Sp I guess you can go ahead. No, Spence needs to go first on that one. Uh, okay. Because he has... He has the before and after history with the model at the church. <laughs> so Spence, why don't you do it first and then I'll talk. Okay, yeah, I, uh, I went back, I made some notes uh, that because I, my memory isn't like it probably once was or maybe never was, I don't know. Anyway, uh, we started, uh, our senior pastor uh, initiated a, a task force, I think it was in 2010. And with the Hodgkiss book, we started the process for about several months, but it was clear that the task force wasn't, I'd say had enough horsepower, horsepower is the wrong word, had enough um, just comprehensive of governance and so forth in balance. And it wasn't, didn't really take so, so then we took a little hiatus and, and then Re reformed a little bit with a couple of other members that really uh, were uh, helpful and uh and and so and then so i think our model year was in 2013 yeah we completed things in tw by 2012 with the task force and we did but i'll have to say we did a lot of stuff and prepared then for the test year in 2013 and we did a lot of things including um, how to communicate with the congregation and to make sure that we didn't have um, any issues there that uh, so that congregation really felt that we were responsibly going and this wasn't some kind of committee doing something that nobody knew about and and I know that uh, and, but we put in a lot of hours I'll have to say we put in a lot of hours and then we wrote a lot of documents and then eventually even wrote the new bylaws and stuff before we started the test year. And uh, I, I would make, and so I would, went from there, I was on the board then from the test year and then for six years following that up until this last January. And I was also treasurer of the uh, church. I, I come out of a business background, uh, but have been involved with a lot of um, boards, both nonprofit and other. And this was really my th uh, third, my fourth, time going through a governance uh, change in the organization that I was part of. And so I, I, I had great confidence that this in fact would work and would be, and based on my background at our church, I really felt it would be good for our church. And so I think that was good. Now, one thing happened in the midst of ours, we had a, as we started our test year, we had the, um, we had a behavioral issue with the senior pastor and he left. So, and I would say today, I've always been kind of convinced had we not been on the, this model, I'm a little concerned whether we would have actually survived as a congregation because that was very traumatic uh, experience uh, for everyone. And so, um, but there were some pros and cons about all of that, and I can comment that later. But anyway, so I've been involved with it in detail all, all the way through. I know very much that it's much easier to do the governance and uh, strategic part of this thing than the ministry part of the thing. And I have a lot of comments about that. And so, uh, but, but maybe I'll, I'll uh, so that's my background. Thank you, Ben. So how about you, Jerry? Did you want to tell us yeah, a little bit about Yeah, uh, just to add on a, a little bit to that. Uh, I was, before I retired and moved to Asheville, we were in the Elon Community UCC Church for about 24 years. And it was a traditional United Church of Christ governance model. You had all your boards. We had a 22-member board, you know, that, that sort of thing. Frequently, we're not able to, you know, get a quorum for a board meeting. 
So when we moved to Asheville and, and we joined First Congregational, as Spence had indicated, they had already adopted the model. So I was not part of the transition process into the model, but became moderator a couple of years after joining the church with the model in operation. And it was, the experience was quite different from being moderator back at the, back at the Elon church because we had a board that we generally had a quorum. I mean, it was very rare that, that there was never a quorum. Board members were prepared. They had done the homework they needed to do. And I think Spence is exactly right. We had the crisis in leadership with the, the senior pastor having to leave. There were a couple of years there that uh, if we had not had this tighter governance model, uh, I think things would have been very difficult for the church. Uh, the fact that it was a seven member board was having to do a lot of the work that you don't normally expect boards to do because of the transition. Uh, the, in, the, in the top leadership, we had a couple of interim pastors in there before we finally were settled on a senior pastor. Of course, you want, you want a period of time when a pastor has to leave like that to have some healing take place. Uh, but uh, I think the experience has been very positive. My two terms as moderator, I just could not have been more pleased with the dedication of the board members and, and getting the work of the church done. Uh, and I agree with Spence that that part of it has probably been a little bit easier. Uh, the ministry part of it uh, did not get fully going before we had the ministerial crisis. So our new senior minister was coming into to a situation where the governance part was probably in place, but she was having to start focusing on developing the ministry portion of the job. And that is, that's evolving and ongoing right now. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, I know that when we interviewed you all and spoke with you before that um, that you both of your comments about how that model was so helpful for you and coming um, during that time of, uh, of transition was um, was very powerful for us to hear you say how helpful the model was and uh, made a big impact on us. So um, we Lindsay, touched on it. Lindsay, may I add to what Jerry said? Um, yeah. We, um, our board, we reduced our board in size too. And one of the reasons that we went with this model is, you know, this, everyone knows this, when everybody's responsible, nobody's responsible. And reducing the size of the board did make a big difference. I mean, all good people, but everybody kind of waiting for somebody else to, to, to take responsibility. And we also needed to have have um, the put our minister in our church is uh, is over the ministries and has sole control over the ministries the board is not does not control the ministries in our church but the the, the our minister is also the chief of staff and we could be prior to going to this model we could not we wasted well, that's, that's judgmental, shouldn't be judgmental. We spent more time on small little issues and not time on the fiduciary responsibility that the board has for the overall spiritual growth as well as financial aspects of the church. So going to this model, I, was, I came back on the board again um, three years ago and the sea change in how well this operates from the first time on the board when we didn't have this to now we're spending issues we're spending our time on the things that are important for our own spiritual growth and for um the the growth of our church i'd like to if i could uh i would i would like to just to support what barb and jerry said and make a couple of comments on our experiments related to, to really two things. Uh, one thing was uh, the, um, 
depending on the history of the individual senior pastor, Megan, but in, you may not like this term that I use, but the senior pastor becomes the CEO of the church under this model. You don't want to call it that. People are uncomfortable with that. But the fact of the matter is, under the old model, responsibility was kind of dispersed. Under this model, it's not dispersed. The senior pastor is now the CEO. They are in charge of the church. People work for the senior pastor. And, uh, and that's uh, the way it says in our bylaws, the senior pastor uh, serves at the pleasure of the congregation. But day-to-day -day, uh, administrative responsibility reports to the board. The, uh, the, so this adjustment for the senior pastor, I know that our senior pastor was uh, not really prepared for that kind of thinking. The second thing is um, we made a mistake. We didn't know how to handle the ministry part of the process where we got rid of all these committees. Now we, we adopted two committees and today we still only have two committees. We have a finance committee and a personnel committee, each three member, one of who is on the board, that's it. And we have a list of what they do. But the, the thing we, we didn't know how to handle the ministry part and the book in my sense, that this is an earlier edition, maybe it got better, I, I'm not sure but it didn't really talk about how to do that. So what we did was a pretty logical thing. We designated somebody as a ministry coordinator. And we struggled with that through this transition period where we had temporary pastors, difficult to you know, do the things in that environment, uh, issues related to the, to, to the and, 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 and in retrospect, the leadership of the ministry part of this is the senior pastor, period, my view. And when Kim came in and assumed that role, all of a sudden, the many things in the church began to be much more effective. People, when they came up, they wanted to do things and, and they organized things and so forth. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so I think we're, we're much better into our mission, but, uh, uh, but designating that leadership of the ministry part to another individual, it might have been some individual's issue and so forth, but to me that, that was a mistake. But I don't know with temporary pastors and so forth, that difficult to do anything there. But when Kim came in, this has reaffirmed not only that the governance thing works and is very effective, but also now the ministry thing is also beginning to show its uh, value. Thank you so much. Very so much to, so. Uh, just to I'll, clarify, oh, sorry. I was just no, going to clarify ahead, that Kim is, your, uh, Kim is your current minister that's serving serving your church yes. now, a, correct? A, How long has she been? She's a pastor. She came in. Jerry, when did she come in? She's into her third year. Third year. Okay. So she's, she's, into the, she's into the third year. She came in February 1st, 2018. Yeah, 2019. Yes, yeah, she's starting her third year. Essentially into her the, third year. The thing about what Kim did, Kim did not come out of this kind of a reorganization thing in the church she was in. She was in a in a in a UCC church, but in Atlanta. But she took she rolled up her sleeves, understood what the tried to understand what we were doing. May have actually probably <laughs> I'd let her say this probably enjoyed the governance model some, began to adjust to the CEO kind of concept, but then rolled up her sleeves on the ministry thing and made some changes there and actually assumed the role of, of, being, of running that and that has made a world of difference. Yeah, she's assembled ministry teams and each team has a chair or a captain. I think they call themselves captains the ministry teams. So she meets, she as the senior pastor meets with the group of ministry team captains on a regular basis. I say meets, a lot of this is pre-pandemic 
<laughs> so, you know, things have, have drastically changed since February. Uh, uh, so a lot of what we say about the ministries kind of goes back before we had to, you know, hunker down a little bit, but, but she was getting that well organized, uh, doing that. And, um, so now they're having to do some of their work remotely, just like we're doing right now. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was beginning to blossom. Uh, I think the, the growth has been sort of on a hiatus right now until we could figure out, you know, where we go from here. Well, thank you. So I wanted to re lead us back a little bit and you've spoken to it. Um, you all spoken a little bit about this, but wanted to just have you answer uh, how you feel like this model has changed your congregation. Um, has it renewed and revitalized it? Has it um, helped you live into your mission? So um, Barb, would you be able to answer that for us? We can spend time on our mission because the nuts and bolts underlying kind of decisions like can someone use the church banner? We don't have to have a board meeting for that anymore. We don't have to have a congregational vote. We don't have everybody in the congregation weighing in on what kind of technology does the office staff get to have. They've got a budget for that. They make the decisions with uh, our minister as chief of staff about what they need. And we can spend our time on the joy of coming to church and living our mission, personal growth, growth as a, a worshiping community and serving the community in the world. And it makes the first time I was on the board, I drove home one night I was clutching the steering wheel and thinking, I can't do this. This is why I retired from public school. I can't sit through meetings with people, with people arguing about these kinds of things any longer. <laughs> when I came back on the board three years ago, it is a joy to serve on the board. I love working on, I love working with this in our church now. And our, our, the people in our church who want to be involved in the caring ministry, for instance, you know, they, they can go ahead with that mission. They can go ahead and serve. They don't have to be worrying about the nuts and bolts of running the organization. So there was a lot of concern about we're giving the minister too much control or, um, uh, how much how controlling this would be and everybody having a decision no we can focus on the things uh i a lot one of the quotes i like to uh from simple church was nobody comes to church to work themselves to death on a committee people come to church to worship and every time we walk out the door we should have a sense of joy not of exhaustion and I think people walk out of the church now after everything from meditation to the caring committee, to our worship associates, to our um, uh, social justice committee with a sense of joy because that's the mission that they're serving. And, and it's huge, huge difference. Thank you, Barb. Um, Spencer or Jerry, did you want to um, comment on that question? Uh, I can't really respond to how it has changed the congregation because, as I said, I don't have a before and after experience at First Congregational because I came in after the model had been adopted. I know that it's working well in terms of governance, and I'm seeing the, the blossoming of the ministries, but Spence is in a better position to talk about before and after. <laughs> I remember when uh, I joined the church in early 2000. Speak up, Spence. You're not real loud. Um, am I better now? Some. How about you? Can you hear me, Lindsay? Yep. Yeah, yeah. You sound, you sound pretty maybe good. It's, maybe it's me. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, I had mentioned, you know, we had this 21 person board, hard to get a quorum, uh, hard to get agreement. 
Uh, and um, it really manifested itself in some what I would consider very poor financial uh, management of the church. I remember the first meeting I went to and I had looked at the numbers and I, 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 I ran some businesses in my background. So I know a lot about numbers and what they mean to an organization. I looked at the numbers and the only thing I could say is, you know, your folks are eating your lunch. And uh, they kept eating their lunch for a while, but then I became treasurer. And uh, one of the things that happened is um, we have monthly meetings with the board uh, and uh, every month we report the numbers. You have to remember the senior pastor is responsible for managing the budget and, and, her, and her, his or her staff. But the finance committee is clearly there to support the, the senior pastor in budgeting and in process and all that stuff. And I, as treasurer, look at, looked at the numbers every week because we do not, we're not a big church with a, an endowment and all that kind of stuff, but we meet our budget. And so one of the things that really happened then was uh, when we talk about fiduciary responsibility, uh, that kind of responsibility became serious with the board members. And, and so not that we didn't have some issues uh, as we got our arms around having realistic budgets and meeting budgets, period. We, um, but this, the, the board itself uh, was very, so we had a group that was very much informed and everybody was with it. And, the, and we had a staff that, you know, they took the budget seriously because they were responsible for it. It wasn't the finance committee or somebody else. Uh, uh, so there are two committees, the finance committee and personnel committee are there both to support the staff and report to the board. And so that's very, that's very important that that, uh, it, it, for us, it was very important. And that, that seems to have worked uh, very well in terms of uh, um, how things evolved. And I think, I think really the senior pastor who started this process, I think sensed the fact that nothing was working very well. It was complicated, hard to find people responsibility, getting people to say, oh yeah, I'd love to be on that committee. Well, that, you know, we don't want anybody to say, I'd love, if somebody wants to do something, all they have to do is stand up and say, yeah, I'm, what I'd like to do is this, and they get the approval a little bit uh, and, and support from the staff and away they go. So, um, so, so, so one of the things we did much more as a board, we began to work on policies that allowed the staff and others to run the church in a more consistent, uh, more consistent way. Thank Let you, me give you. I think that's an important part point to clarify. Um, I know that that has been an area where, where people have had questions as to how those committees and the staff um, work together. So it is good to hear uh, your perspective. Well, uh, we, Jerry, we, I, I made some notes what we did as a task force. Because uh, what we did as a task force, we actually wrote uh, the responsibility of the finance committee, how many people would be on it, and uh, which is three, and one person on the board, not necessarily the treasurer, but that's usually what works. And, um, well, the treasurer would be on it, but wouldn't necessarily be the, the, the chair of the finance committee, but okay. And then and the personnel committee was actually the, the same way. And so we wrote exactly the responsibilities of the finance committee, what they do and what they don't do. And it's all, if you read, and it's pretty detailed what we do. And I'll have to say, I mean, we work very hard as a really support on the financial end of it for the senior staff, the senior pastor, and then the senior pastor with the, with the staff. And so we wrote, we wrote those. Uh, we, of course, made the decision on how many members would be in the board. We decided on seven, so an uneven number. And of course, the pastor is ex officio. We prepared the duties of the board. We wrote those also. Uh, we established the two committees. I just talked about that. We established there was there'd be three-year terms and two would be reelected each year by the congregation. 
we established who were the, we wrote the, how the, the uh, selection of new board members would be done and some of the criteria that would be looked at in that selection. And that had a lot of congregational involvement. We, um, we wrote covenants. Um, we, um, we wrote all new bylaws. And then we had, um, we had somebody who came out of uh, human resources in, in industry and was, worked very hard in writing all the personnel policies. Um, and so those are a few of the actions we took as a, uh, so the congregation had a pretty good, if they wanted to, you know, it's, uh, these governance and numbers are the same thing. Most people's eyes kind of glaze over when you make these two statements. But, uh, but the, the boards, but people were really, they could understand exactly what we were talking about. And that gave confidence, I think, to the congregation that, that we in fact knew what we were doing. And, uh, and they, and the congregation does elect the board members. And that is important, um, which kind of brings me to another question that I wanted to to make sure that we answer and um, and and hoping that we can get an idea of how you invite people to participate in leadership. And is it easier to get participation than it used to be? Um, Jerry, would you be able to answer that for us? Well, I don't know, you know, bef before the model was adopted, how easy it was uh, to get people to serve on that that large board, I know that it at the Elon Church where we had the 22 member board, it uh, there was always a struggle for the nominating committee to you know get get people to serve on on the various departments and boards. Since I've been at First Congregational, uh, and Spence, we do have this third seasonal committee, the uh, nominating committee <laughs> that meets for a brief period of time. <laughs> Sorry. The board of, the board does appoint the nominating committee of, of three people, but it only exists long enough to uh, you know get nominees for the the open positions. Um, so I call it a seasonal committee, not a standing committee. But uh, they have had some up and down experiences. Uh, some years they've had no trouble at all developing a, a slate of of candidates. Uh, other years they've struggle to even get people to agree. We have two open board seats this time and this past year that was all they were able to get was two people to agree to be a candidate. So, you know, obviously the, those people were elected, but in years previous, uh, there had been competitive, quote, you know, board board elections. Uh, so that's been sort of an up and down and I don't, I think that's probably natural. Uh, to do that. Um, I don't think the ministry teams, once they have formed, have had a lot of trouble getting people. People were eager to serve on various ministry teams. So I think that aspect of it has seems to be going well uh, at this point, again, pre-pandemic. Uh, so so that, that, but, but that's a bottom, instead of a top-down committee thing, that's a, 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 that's a bottom-up right. ministerial right. thing. And that's a big difference. Yeah, yes. that's a big difference there. Um, well, let me give you an example of sort of how the, the policy operates with the senior pastor uh, actually being the, the CEO type person that Spence uh, talked about. We have a personnel committee, uh, one of the key committees of the, of the board. So when we need, when the senior minister proposes that a new staff or, maybe create a new staff position or a staff person leaves and we have to hire a new staff person. She works with the personnel committee to develop the job descriptions and, and those kinds of things that, that go along with establishing a position. Uh, the, the personnel committee is real good about surveying the surrounding market. What a, what a competitive salaries pay scales for for, for this kind of position, for instance, a church organist, what is it like in the Asheville area to, to have a church organist? How, anyway, they develop all those kinds of things. Then that is brought to the board 
uh, the board has to approve the position and the board has to approve the salary range. But once that has happened, the board is not directly involved in the employment. That goes between the personnel committee and senior pastor if they need to form a search committee or whatever. That's not something that the board gets involved in the nitty gritty of once we have approved the position and, and the salary range. So that is under the purview of the senior pastor because all the staff reports to the senior pastor. They don't report to the board. The senior pastor reports to the board. Staff reports to the senior pastor. She's got to be the one supervising them, so she's got to be intimately involved in the employment. We can't employ them because we don't supervise them. <laughs> you know, bottom line, we are responsible for them because we have the re re fiduciary responsibility for the church, but not the day-to-day -day operation. Yes, thank you for that um, clarification. I think that that is an important point to bring up and something that we, uh, you know, that, that is the, also the way that we are planning on running this model. And it is something that the congregation has had questions about. Um, and we have had some congregants uh, concerned about that also. We've had some, some voices that they want to be more involved in that. Well, you don't supervise them. You can't, you know, you, it's not your place to be that directly involved uh, in that. And so there's had to be some education on the part of our congregation uh, to, to be more comfortable with that. And we probably still have some who would like to have a more direct say but uh, that's not something the board gets intimately involved in. Once, you know, we take the larger picture, this is, fits the mission of the church. This would be a good position for the operation of the church. Here are the funds, go to it. So. Yeah. You know, we've had, we've had a lot of, uh, every now and then we get comments about, well, this secretive group of people that meet and we never know anything about. Of course, there are the, the board meetings are always open, except for maybe an executive session. The minutes are always published. A resume of those are put in the newsletter. So, uh, but we still get uh, criticisms from time to time, especially when there's an issue comes up where somebody doesn't agree on, you know, <laughs> is this model working? And, uh, you know, why don't we ever know anything and so forth? So, but, so there's always this question, are we communicating enough with the congregation? I can say that we, we try, but uh, that's a, that's a. Let me give you an example of satisfy everybody, I guess. Two things that, that I helped to implement when, when I, my first term as moderator, uh, to try to respond to this concern that we don't know what the board's doing, the board doesn't communicate. Uh, we have a weekly newsletter, it's electronic, and the board meets monthly. So uh, with, in the next newsletter, after we have our board meeting, I would start writing a, a brief column for the newsletter that was just board meeting highlights. Now, those were not the board minutes because the minutes are never approved until the next meeting. So we don't make the minutes available until they are approved. So the minutes are delayed, a, uh, the official minutes are delayed a month. But I would give a, a brief board meeting highlights. Uh, got a lot of positive feedback from the congregation on on having that in the newsletter, so they at least knew what the board was was talking about and dealing with. And the second thing that we had have implemented, and of course under the pandemic we've had to sort of call a halt to that. We started quarterly con congregational conversations not congregational meetings were about, but just conversations. We would identify a couple of topics or some congregation members might identify a couple of uh, topics that after church, uh, during, our, during our social hour after church, we would have the board there and we just thought, okay, what are your thoughts about this? So trying to seek, you know, get an input, input from the congregation of what they were thinking about some various issues and one, one of the recent ones we had had to do with church security and we are a downtown church so security is is a little different for us if you're in a more than if you're in a more rural setting but we are at the heart of downtown Asheville and so that has a lot of security issues related with it uh, 
uh, being where we are. And so how close does the church need to be? So we threw that out for a conversation, got a lot of different comments on that. <laughs> Uh, and it has helped to inform the board as, as we have had to make some decisions periodically, those kinds of conversations. And I think that's helped. Of course, we haven't been able to have any. <laughs> right. I know it's a, it's a challenging time right now, and we're all having to kind of adjust to what we're doing. Um, so thank you for those suggestions and comments about your experience. Um, and what has helped you with communication with the church. And I wanted to bring Barb in. Did you have a comment relating to, to that? Um, and I also wanted to ask you, Barb, because you were involved in the process um, in the trial run. During that trial run time, did you have things that you, you all tweaked about your process? Um, so if you have comments on that and then also on the, what we were also talking about. In terms of bringing people into leadership, um, I have been adamant with other board members. And as you, you can tell, I'm not the youngest board member. I'm not the youngest board member by a lot of years. Don't tell people when you're asking them to run for the board that it's really not that much work. This is easy. If this is a once a month meeting, you come and give your opinion. You don't have to make it sound like it's the worst job in the world because it isn't. It's a wonderful opportunity to serve the church, but you need to read. You need to keep up. You can't just come on the board and not reach hot just and not know anything about policy. And, and you can talk to people about this in a very positive and upbeat way, but people need to know this is a commitment. And when people bail out of the leadership aspect, it's because in our situation, they didn't know what they were getting into. And so it's not, it, it, it's not onerous by any means, but be straightforward with people about how important this is and what the commitment is when you're asking them to run for the board. And then with regard to other leadership positions in the church, before we got into this model um, and when we were doing budget differently, which I can only describe as everybody's worst nightmare, um, we, it was so onerous to be a chair of a committee like the the service committee or the caring committee or worship associates because you couldn't get a straight ant you didn't know who to go to to get an answer about something and it's it according to the governance in the unitarian churches the minister and hotchkiss's recommendation pretty much the ministers over the minister the the ministries and so people knew where to go to get an answer and tom below our minister um, very young, but he came to us with 15 years experience, um, knows, he, he streamlined a lot of things and he got people working together and the arrows going more in the same directions and people cooperating in less duplication of effort. So removing the frustration really helped with people doing, um, really helped with people's frustration and willingness to take on, on leadership roles. In terms of tweaking the policies, um, Hotchkiss said, because uh, we, were, we were so nervous going into this about what's going to happen. Are people going to accept this? How is it going to work? Hotchkiss told us, and he pr it proved to be right, they're not even going to notice. This <laughs> year is probably going to work this is just going to go real well, but don't be fooled by that. So what helped us in that trial year, and this would not have worked in our church if we hadn't had two people come in as president of the congregation who read the material, found out, read the policies, and showed incredible leadership with this and commitment to this. If they hadn't done that, I don't know. I don't know what would have happened. But we all we told we kept telling people this is not written in stone this is a trial year we can tweak anything and so get repeatedly giving people that reassurance i think was very helpful we moved into the trial year uh, there were a few i i went off the board um and and there were some things that needed to be tweaked particularly in our church the bylaws are like the um the um, c 
covenants or contracts in some of the other churches. Our bylaws are really our foundational documents. There were some things that needed to be changed in our bylaws, like uh, our bylaws had specified the number of board members and we had fewer. So there were some things like that that needed to be tweaked. We asked the congregation, just trust us, we'll make changes as they're needed. It went very smoothly. Hotchkiss warned us, don't be fooled by that. You can't rest on your laurels. You need to keep up with this. And I will tell you, coming back on the board, I went off in 2010 and I came back on the board. Coming back on the board seven years later, for the people who kept up, and the board presidents were really good about keeping up with policy in general, and, and it, yes, that worked. For the board members for whom it hadn't really been stressed, you need to keep up with what this model is. You need to understand our governance structure. It was a little shaky. And so we have done a lot in the last three going on four years of, of beefing that up again and making, uh, ensuring that we have a lot of board learning opportunities. I'm sure that Hotch, I'm sure you read and um, it, it came through to you in Hotch because one of the things boards are least likely to do is give the time they need to board learning because, oh, it's getting late, let's move on to something else. That board learning, that conversation about what our responsibility is to the congregation, the discernment. And in our church, we talk about fiduciary responsibility as the definition of caretaking. And it's not just the financial fiduciary responsibility, it's the spiritual caretaking responsibility as well. So now we build that into the board, meeting, uh, board meetings and that's, that's made a huge difference. So yeah, we tweak constantly. And another thing that uh, we have reiterated is the policies are the broad, uh, uh, Carver says big bowls, Hotchkiss makes some reference to that. The policies are the overarching. The, pr the procedures are how you carry the policy out. Right. And so we're doing a lot more work on the, on the procedures part of it procedures for the nominating committee and um, we can tweak those much more easily procedures for how we conduct congregational meetings procedures for how we do any number of things and uh, those we can change those much more easily as we need to did that answer the question lindsay Yes, thank you so much for, yes, for sharing your experiences. Um, I wanted to go ahead and open up and see if any of... Um, Can I make another comment about board? Uh, one of the things that we've done that in terms of board education is for the last three years, when we have a, a board election, your board members, we have an all-day board retreat as quickly as we can after that new board election so we're bringing new board members on and we because we have a seven member board we elect two two and three so you one year every third year we are electing three people uh but generally it's two so we do have an all all day an all day board retreat to to get the quote new church here started with the new board and the other comment i would want to make about being a board member not not a not a moderator but being a board member because you are only one of seven if you're not prepared for a board meeting <laughs> it's very obvious as opposed to being not prepared in a 20 member board <laughs> so so you're kind of on the spot personally uh by being only one of seven in a board so yeah, yeah i would i would reinforce jerry just a little bit is that the new members are encouraged to read hotchkiss's book to right. understand that sometimes we actually have it's not so critical anymore because more people are with the program so to speak but that's still important and to understand that that the process and the conversation uh and so uh yeah and so that and 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 uh, the and the fact that uh um a board member has to be prepared and and there i mean we're we, we only have, I, I think, 
we're required to have six board meetings a year, but I think we act by bylaws and we rewrote, I'll have to say, we wrote, rewrote, rewrote all of the bylaws uh, to, mod, to match up with the governance process we were putting in place. And the, the uh, so, uh, so the bylaws are, you know, have, have been, uh, have been pretty fundamental and, and I don't think we've only made a couple of changes since we've we only amended them once yeah, since they were adopted. And, yeah. and that was just to change the date of the annual meeting. <laughs> Here's something that we have learned you have to keep in mind. I'm looking at the ages of you in these pictures I'm seeing and you see my age. There is a digital divide between the people my age, because we talk about reading something and having a hard copy of, of Hotchkiss's book, and some of the younger members were very dismissive of, I don't read, I don't do any paper, or I don't, I don't do any paper, I do everything online. And I'm actually good enough friends to say to one of them, yeah, and that's why you never remember anything, Andy, because it's just, it's gone. But we, we're, we're having to do things both ways, given the uh, ages of our congregation, doing things digitally as well as doing things hard copy. The important thing being people have the information. Thank you. Uh, so I want to go ahead and open it up to comment or to questions if any of our participants have questions. Um, you can raise your hand or you can write a question over in the chat and I can make sure that um, I ask it. So does anybody have a question for our panel? Cheryl? She got on. Okay. Oh, there Sorry. We go. Okay. I had to unmute. I thought Megan had all the powers. Um, thank you all. That was great. Um, I've chaired strategic planning for the past three years. So just to give you guys um, an understanding. Uh, where we are right now is we are, um, our nom nominating committee is being formed to come up with a slate of officers um, that we hope to have start July 1st. We are forming a seven member board. Uh, six are congregational members and um, Pastor Megan is the seventh. She is not ex officio, she is a full voting member because we agree with the way you've put it. She is the CEO if you were in a private company scenario. Um, but where we are talking about is the election of the officers of this board the governing board. Uh, uh, we are uh, believing that the nominating committee in talking to potential people who they have identified, but also who can self-nominate, um, they, uh, the nominating is going to try to put together a slate, which is stating the positions of our moderator is going to be called chair of the board, we'll have a vice chair, we'll have a secretary, we'll have a treasurer, and we will have two members at large who are, are somewhat following our current members at large, and that is a lot of interaction and, uh, with the congregation to get the feelings and the feedback. But we wonder, to start this first year, we've got two people coming on for a one-year term, two people coming on for a two-year term, and two people committing to a three-year term until we can get into the classified board every you know, right. year you're gonna be right. elected to. Right. So as to officers and positions on the governing board, how do you all do that? And if you have experience on how you started that, could you share with us, please? Mm. Barb, did you want to go ahead and try to answer, are, are you able to answer that question since you were there at the start? I need a minute because I'm supposed to be in another meeting and I need to ask somebody else to lead it. So I'll be oh, back. Okay. Just, no, no, no. I'll be back in just a moment. Thank you all very much. I, I, can, comment, I can comment a little bit uh, and if you want some feedback. Uh, we did discuss at long length this issue of uh, the senior pastor being ex officio or a member of the board. And we made it ex officio 
and uh, having been involved in the decision back then and, and have strong opinion about that from different places, um, we went with ex officio and, and I think that's been, been very successful. Remember the, she, the senior pastor reports to the board. We have a seven person board because, so we, we always have at least a four or three, but I have to say, there's almost never that I've ever been involved in a decision that the whole board hadn't, you know, through discussion and so forth, come to a common decision as the right, right. thing to do. And so, uh, but that independence from the senior pastor whom the board is responsible to supervise, I think is an important thing, but you know, each has to do their own thing. Now, when we made the, one of the things, the criteria we wrote down in the task force, when we had this, uh, we put together a selection of um, uh, candidates, we look for certain uh, background and criteria that would be strengthening. So they weren't all um, former pastors or, or all former business people or all, um, you know, we dealt with the, the you know, the, the geography of the, uh, of the, you know, the congregation. And so to make sure that you know, there was kind of a balance between all of that and, and looking for specific experiences in some areas like personnel, uh, finance, ministry, those uh, to have some kind of balance. And then the criteria for our three person nominating committee uh, going forward, um, nominating committee chosen by the board uh, from Nom from nominations from the congregation and uh, but the that three-person board then looks at who's going off the board to try to if that person had, was exceptional in personnel that they try to find somebody who, candidates that have that uh, background so to, to try to get a balanced background uh, on decision making and jerry maybe you can comment better than i have on that no i think that's a good point uh and it's it's not only the, the, the expertise of the congregants, but it's also the demographics of the congregants. Uh, I mean, you know, you, we had to try to you know, get a balance between male, female, LGBT, you know, th those kinds of things that, that we try to reflect who we are uh, as a congregation in, in terms of, of the board. So th those are the things that the nominating committee does. Uh, our board elects its own officers the nominating committee does not put together a slate that designates people as to to be board officers so the board elects its own officers uh once the congregation has elected the board uh and um but my charge to the nominating committee you know the for it to be reflective of the congregation and and in the spirit of congregational governance my philosophy has been the board cannot control the nominating process. Uh, we get we get the members of the nominating committee appointed based on you know input from the congregation. As moderator, I met with the nominating committee one time, <coughs> essentially to give them their charge, and then it then from that point the board did not intervene in in that process. So the nominating committee was working with, with the congregation uh, to, to select the nominees. And I think that's important, at least it's important for our congregation to, to preserve that spirit of congregational governance. This is how you are governing the church is by how you select people to the board. Uh, that, that's your biggest input into, into congregational governance. So it's important that the board not clone itself <laughs> yes. Now, wait, you say you, your board of, of, um, elects its own officers. How long do those officers serve? Do they, do they elect them for a term of a year? Or? It's, it's an election each year, but okay. in, in, in the case of the treasurer, if we've got a good treasurer, Spence was elected treasurer for six years in a row. Uh, the okay. treasurer is not one that you necessarily want to change every year. 
Uh, you know, you look at the officer. Uh, I served two consecutive terms as moderator, um, uh, asked to by the board. Uh, but, you know, after, after two terms, I said, you know, that's enough. I don't need to be, you know, on the, in leadership position for the third year. You know, somebody else needs to step up and, and do that. So, but yeah, it's, okay. it's an election each year, but there is, depending on the, the Bush position, there's some continuity. Uh, you look maybe at a vice moderator as someone who could perhaps step into the moderator role, <laughs> that, that sort of thing. Now, now you're, by, you're, our bylaws designate uh, who the officers are, but I, I reinforce with Jerry that this board selecting officers is a, is a very good process. And, and everyone that I've been involved in, all four, we did the same thing. And, I, and that, um, because as a congregation, you, you cannot feel the dynamics of the seven person board or six person in your case. You can't feel that dynamics day to day. The board has a feeling of that dynamics, and 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 it, and I think you, in that sense, you get a um, because in discussions, no, <laughs> nobody cares whether you're the moderator or not, in terms of the discussion, you know. So uh, I, I really, I really have liked that process, and I think it's been very successful in our church, in that, in the, in the terms of. Uh, having the board select its own officers. Great, look, Barb looks like you're back, able to join I us. I am back, I got somebody else to lead the meditation oh. group. The pers I had that Thank all covered, so the person. I'll bet this has never happened to any of you. The person who was supposed to lead emailed me five minutes ago, she's sick and can't do that. So anyway, oh. all taken care of. Thank heavens for Zoom. Anyway, um, we don't have contested elections. We, and that wasn't really part of the governance. We, th this actually happened, um, our bylaws specified contested elections, but we had members who wouldn't run for the board because they didn't wanna run against someone else. Now remember, I'm in Chapel Hill. We're snowflakes. And so there were hurt feelings and people felt it was a, popula a popularity contest. If you were a member of the choir, that's the biggest ministry in the church, you were gonna get elected. So um, our nominating committee has a lot, a lot, a lot of, of uh, power when it comes to who goes on the board. What we we did run into a real kerfuffle last year, and uh, so as a result of that, we've developed um, uh, pretty specific procedures. The nominating committee, very very well intended, wonderful group of people, wasn't given enough direction, is what it came down to. So we have very much um, codified what happens, how it happens, when it happens. Um, what, one of the things that we, one of, we ask the board, we ask the nominating committee to look at diversity on our board so that we don't wind up with only the old retired folks like me or people who are brand new to the congregation and don't understand what they're getting into so we have a list of things that we would like them to look at in terms of having a well-rounded board. Um, so, but we do not have contest, we don't have contested election because it was, it, that actually came out of the membership with a letter to the board saying, please, could we end these? It's just causing too much strife within the um, community. We, our last contested, contested election was 2011 and things have gone fine. Now what we're not doing as well is what Jerry and Spence have talked about. We, if we choose a vice president um, with, we, we have a nine member board, three people run each time unless we have a vacancy and we're filling that. Um, we have 
we have two board members at large and then one person who's nominated for the vice president role who moves into being president and then has a year as past president. We've, we're having a lot of conversation right now about choosing members within the board because we, it, it's been clear that people who move into that vice president role are, uh, it's hard to get somebody to do that when they haven't been on the board. And uh, we feel like if people could serve on the board, they'd have a better idea of what they were getting into and what the responsibilities were. And if they haven't served on the board before, kind of bringing them up to, to speed about what the board process is. So I'm gonna be getting in touch with Jerry and Spence right after this to find out how you do the elections from within the board. <laughs> Wonderful. I, I would, I would, I would uh, add one thing to that, Barb, that, uh, that came to my mind as I was just uh, sitting here. Our bylaws specify uh, that uh, the term, normal term is for three years. And you can be elected, and I can verify that, to a second three-year term if you want, if you agree to run for a second year term and the congregation wants you to do that. The, I think there's one thing that's important because if you, uh, these smaller boards need continuity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't want to always end up with, uh, you know, on a seven person board, you elect six new members. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, that would be, I would consider relatively dangerous. So whatever mm -hmm. your process is in the bylaws, continuity and, the, and with new members and all that stuff, uh, that, that what I think is important is to make sure you also have some continuity uh, uh, in that process. Uh, and, and, but, but the board can deal with that right? and when they do the election, their own officers and so forth. But I just wanted to mention that that's what our bylaws say. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that came up with regard to um, looking at a well-rounded board, and I was really tickled that it was one of the younger board members that brought this up, institutional memory came up because the issue of someone said, um, well, we've never had contested elections. And I was able to say, yeah, we did have contested elections. And here's Elspeth's letter to the board. Uh, Elspeth is 95 years old. She's Dutch, very strong. She wrote this powerful letter about the problems with elections and when Elspeth speaks, people listen. So um, that was the letter that um, uh, helped us get the bylaws changed so that we didn't have the, we didn't have contested elections. But when I, nobody else on the, nobody else sitting in that room had been around or been involved with that. So um, that's one of the, one of the important things in terms for us, a well-rounded board, people who've been around long enough to remember the stuff nobody else has had time to read. Right. Is there uh, any other, did anybody else have a question um, that they wanted to ask our panel? I saw want to be respectful of everybody's time. I know that um, we are all, very I thought I saw a question in the chat. Maybe it's already been answered. Uh, I couldn't respond to it. That bit been, been one. I think the question had to deal with how did you get started, you know, electing your, your board first. And uh, I think Spence, Spence had addressed that. Uh, yeah, you elect, you know, you stagger the first terms so that you can get a rotating board, basically. Oh, Donna, did you have a question? Okay, let me uh, let me unmute you. All right. Yeah, Donna, we can't hear you. Donna, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, can you try to unmute yourself? It's not letting yeah. me unmute you. There you are. There you sorry. go. Okay. There we are. I'm sorry. Um, my question is, how diverse is the membership of your two different churches? Uh, In other our words, church age, sex. Uh, <laughs> Average of age of our congregation is on the high side. <laughs> okay. uh, Which is typical at, for Asheville, probably. Probably, probably. Okay. Uh, so we don't have a lot of young families um, okay. in the church. So it's mostly middle-aged and beyond. Uh, we're about 40% LGBT uh, a congregation. We we're, we're had been very much on the forefront of 
to campaign for marriage equality uh, wow, as, as, a, as a church behind that. Um, it's, it's over 50% female in terms of regular attendance, uh, which again, I don't think is that unusual for churches this day and time, um, at least mainline churches. Um, <coughs> so that's about, Spence, do you have anything else to say about the demographics? It's the only thing I would mention is we have, I don't know, 12 or 15 former pastors from all different families. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. We are, we are retired pastor heavy. <laughs> what kind of influence do they have? Uh, well, I have to, I'll have to say, but my, my view, um, I'm not sure we've used them as effectively as we could, although Kim is working on that, uh, but um, uh, they're retired and they, uh, and, and they have respected, I'll have to say, they, they haven't tried to influence unduly how the church is run or right. what we do or criticize this or that. Uh, no, I think they have come in with a feeling of freedom and, um, and it seems to be, be good. They come every Sunday. And they've retired from all kinds of denominations. Yeah. They're not all retired UCC by any means. Oh, many of them, Presbyterian, Methodist. Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, we don't Church have any of the Brethren. <laughs> I actually have the thing in terms of what we ask, we are asking our nominating committee to look for in terms of balance and diversity. You may find this an interesting list. Economic background, gender identity, age, skill set, length of affiliation with the church, level of experience and volunteering in the church. And we don't have race race or ethnicity because one of the interesting things that our um, uh, black, Hispanic, um, uh, Asian members told us is you absolutely work us to death. You want us to be on every committee because you want to have <laughs> racial, you know, you, you want to think that you're so special and you want to think that everything is so balanced, but you're absolutely killing us. And the minute one of us walks through the door, you're, oh, be on the board, be on this committee. So, you know, this is, we would love to have a, a, a congregation that is racially and ethnically uh, more diverse, but it's not. And no, we're not either. We're not very diverse racially, yeah. ethnically at all. Although one of our current board members is African American. So, yeah. and that's a conversation for a whole other master class on how, yeah. right. how, to become, <laughs> how to become more diverse congregations that I know that people would, would love to have. Um, but okay, so is there any other one last question that anyone anyone might have? No? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for coming and talking with us. It has been wonderful and informative to hear your experiences. Again, um, I know the first time that we talked, we were very new to this model and discovering it. So now it is lovely, at least for me, to be able to hear it um, and, and your comments with more information in my, in my head and having a better wrap around the model. Barb, did you have something you want to add? Lindsay, I want to thank you all for having us. I, I don't know if Jerry and Spencer feel this way, but I have to tell you, it is such a gift after the time and effort that we put in de developing this for our church for someone to ask us how it went. And, and, and yep. also for us to be able to share with you what people were so generous in giving us. So thank you, thank you for inviting me to do this. I would, I'd add one thing. I had a, not too long ago, through some connections, uh, I spent quite a bit of time with somebody out in uh, Portland, a UCC church going through the, getting ready to go through this process. And one of the things that I offered, and, and uh, you know, I talked about some of these documents you know, you're maybe very far along and all happy with all of that, but we'd be glad to share any of the documents uh, that we have for our church. Uh, you know, um, 
in, including including some of the ones we talked about here. How how do you choose board members and what's the procedure <laughs> for that and and so forth. And we actually have a you know procedure model. So so we could uh, in that book we have at the church uh, uh, one could could come pursue that and take whatever you wanted. Thank you. Yes, it sounds like we maybe wanted to take you up on that. I saw Cheryl with a big thumbs up uh, to that. That is part of the process that we're going to be starting. Um, some of those things we've already worked on, um, but as as the model goes through for the year, we will be tweaking our constitution and bylaws and kind of looking at those documents and putting in some of those procedures and trying to figure out how that's going to work um, for our church. So we I think it's important that you kind of force the task force to deal with some of these issues. So you're come together together rather than have these issues uh, starting in the bigger congregation because you haven't really addressed them. You know, the, you, you know, that's like, you know, you know, you create a camel if you do that. And I think that I think it's, I think it's important because you have a lot of, you know, you have people who have understanding and, uh, and focus and have been through the details uh, that have uh, knowledge and experience to bring to these issues as opposed to having opinion without too much of background. And that, uh, so I encourage the task force to, to, to really have kind of thought these things through and articulated them and probably wrote them down. So when the congregation asks it, oh yeah. So they give you confidence also with the longer congregation that you've done your homework. So I'd like to end with maybe just one last final word from each of you about something that's really positive that you felt has come out of this model. If you're able to share that briefly with us, um, we would love to hear your parting thoughts. Barbara, I do feel joy when I go to my church and I'm on uh, several of, of the ministries and I feel tremendous joy. Uh, and I, I attribute a lot of that to us having evolved to this model. Thank you. And Jerry, think, did you have a thought? Yeah, I think Spence and I both kind of alluded to the fact that because of a rough time in the church, the model got us through it. I'm, I'm convinced of that. Thank you. Uh, the rough personnel time. Oh, excuse me. I personally uh, feel that... Um, what we have done is spiritually responsible in the administration of our church. Yeah. That's what I really believe. And, and, uh, and we have that background and experience. And just because we're church doesn't mean we can't address complicated issues uh, responsibly in, in, a, in, a, in a, let's say, a God-directed way. That's what mm -hmm. I feel. Thank you so much. It has been wonderful to talk with you and we so appreciate your time and your perspective and your wisdom. Um, and I'm sure that we will be in contact uh, if you're okay with additional questions uh, and, and reach out. So I'm going to go ahead and, and end us now. So thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your time today. You're quite welcome. Glad to do it. Glad to help. Thank you.